Hi, my name is Ryan Languish, and this is Ludo Lodge, a channel about sparking growth for game designers. And today I'm going to be doing a review of the book Building Blocks of Tabletop Game Design by Jeffrey Engelstein and Isaac Shalev. In this book, the author set out to assemble what the subtitle is here, an encyclopedia of mechanisms. And so really the goal in this book is to pull together a lot of the terminology um, that is developed in our ho in the hobby of tabletop games, such as card drafting or worker placement, um, or all these things that kind of gamers and game designers alike have worked into their vocabulary, and kind of run it through the academic rigor of classification and really breaking things down into clearly defined categories and analyze some of the implications of using some of these different mechanisms. So the structure of the book is essentially over 180 uniquely categorized game mechanisms that are broken into 13 different kind of overarching categories, such as game structure or resolution or auctions or area control. So there's all these kind of larger categories and then a bunch of specific mechanisms that are approaches um, to implementation in that category. And for each one of these mechanisms, a few things um, is included. First, it just has a brief description of what the mechanism is, just from a very objective kind of academic description of this is what, you know, classifies this as a specific mechanism. That's also accompanied by a nice illustration that just shows how that mechanism works in a very kind of clear way. And the illustrations are really well done and, and accompany that, that description really well so that when you're reading it, you can kind of reference that and visualize the mechanism that's being described. That's then followed by a discussion session where the authors essentially talk about, you know, what makes this specific mechanism different from other mechanisms in this same category? What are some of the implications of it on the player experience? What are examples of games that use it and how they use it and how that affects that specific game? And at the end of that description, they give one final list of kind of just, here are some other games that exemplify this mechanism. And then that's it. So you basically have that, that format 180 plus times. So having just finished reading the book myself, I just wanted to give my thoughts on it and maybe help you um, determine whether it's a book that maybe you should check out um, and just give you an idea of kind of what to expect if you were to go into reading this book. And so I think the first thing to mention is that this book is really one of a kind in that I am not aware of another book that approaches tabletop game design in such an, an academic way breaking down mechanisms and defining them and labeling them and just really um, giving the terminology to it in a way that's comparable to other kind of academic subjects um, in the way that things are classified. And so, you know, if you're trying to decide, is this a book that maybe you want to read? It's not so much, is this the best book on the topic versus maybe there's a better book I should be reading? It's really like, this is the one. Um, so I don't think there's a lot of competition in terms of uh, what books are available on the subject. And I think it's cool to see and it kind of shows a maturing of, of the hobby of, of tabletop game design to see this kind of book pr produced and see kind of um, game design being talked about as more of this academic craft that sometimes falls behind the facade of, of games and what people think about when, when they think games. The second thing is that the, the authors here, Jeff and Isaac, they have a pretty good track record as far as their um, credentials to be the authors of this book or their resume. Um, you know, Jeff is the one of the co-founder, co hosts of the Ludology podcast. He has several published games of his own, um, as well as other published books on game design and game theory. And Isaac similarly has a podcast, game podcast and has written many articles on game design and has published games of his own. So I think as far as who, the, the voices that are coming through the book, I think they're the right voices of experience to write a book like this. 
And in my reading through it, I, I think that showed like it, it was very well written and clear and you could just tell that these guys know what they're talking about. They're speaking from a lot of experience and um, understanding of both the, te the technical side of the game design, as well as kind of the more art and the player experience and the implications of some of these mechanisms. One of the big benefits of a book like this is the way that it both clarifies and expands the vocabulary of tabletop game design. There's a lot of things that, you know, designers are aware of or use and can communicate and a lot of times different terms get used for different things and I think the authors did a good job of breaking down you know what what are the right terms to really because it because you know when they're you're categorizing things you're needing to give things specific titles and and specifically labeling things to kind of differentiate between similar concepts and I think you know what this book does is it provides wording that can empower designers to communicate more effectively about their designs. And it's cool, I was reading that the website BoardGameGeek is even working um, to integrate the kind of classification system introduced in this book into the website with their game database um, and classifying mechanisms there. And so I think, you know, this step towards trying to provide more systematic and objective language to the hobby and to game design, I think is a huge benefit and even just helps at, for, for designers on an individual level, being able to think about your own games and talk about it with other designers, having that kind of vocabulary is helpful. And I think this book takes a step towards um, providing that more clearly for people. Another thing that's cool is how it uses so many examples of both modern and older tabletop games that exemplify these different mechanisms. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Because each of these mechanisms, you can, you know, describe what it looks like in isolation, but mechanisms really start to make sense and flourish once they're in the context of a game design. And so reading through the discussion and hearing you know, how this mechanism is used in this game and how it affects that experience was a very rich experience for me reading the book. Um, now, I will say that your experience with the book is probably going to rely a lot on what your exposure to modern board games is. So I'll say for me, going through, probably 95% or more of the games that were mentioned I was aware of and could picture in my head and knew the basics of those games. And so as a result, most of the examples I am able to, to picture, you know, components and picture what's happening or already have kind of some, some opinions or thoughts on that surrounding game design. And so reading through those mechanisms painted a very rich image for me. And I was trying to think of how that might have changed if maybe I had very little exposure to games. And I think it would kind of be a double-edged sword. I think on one hand, you'd lose out on a lot of just that visualization and understanding of things. I think you'd lose some of the power of the examples if you just don't aren't really familiar with the example that's being used. However, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't recommend it to someone who hasn't been exposed to a lot of games because I think this would be a great way, especially if you're an aspiring designer, to get exposed to a lot of what games are doing. And I think you would still get that out of the book, but I would encourage, you know, someone reading it that doesn't feel like they're knowing a lot of the examples to use that as a research opportunity, right? Go out and learn more about that game. Maybe watch a reviews, you know, a quick review of the game to just get that context. Um, but as far as, as doing kind of like a read through of the book, I think that's something worth considering is, is how much just your how many how many modern games do you think you're aware of and know that's going to kind of shape um, how how you read through the book and how you understand some of the examples. One thing that's a little interesting about how the book is written is in that discussion section, it kind of starts to bridge the gap between kind of encyclopedia objective um, laying out of information, and I don't want to say opinion, but there's definitely the voice of the, the authors coming through with recommendations or just advice, um, which can feel a little weird in the context of, of the goals of the book. 
but I think was the right choice to, to go um, because I think there were so many just valuable insights on, you know, if you're using this mechanism, here's some implications that you should be aware of. And I think that's something, you know, oftentimes when, when as designers were designing games, there's kind of a tendency to, to pull the, the first mechanism that comes to mind um, for a certain thing, you know, I, I need to solve this problem. Ooh, I, I see, I know from another game or I remember like, this is a way that I can solve that problem. And oftentimes that's the solution we go after without really analyzing like, what, what collateral implications are there with me choosing this? How else is it affecting the design besides solving the problem I want? And what implications would other choices have? And so I found in reading through this and kind of hearing how the authors talk in that way, I think helps to develop that habit even outside of reading the book. That habit of when you're looking at a mechanism, really asking yourself, what are the implications this has on the game? Like, does this have implications on downtime between turns? Does this have implications on how players are able to, to plan versus needing to just do things very tactically? Um, there's a lot of these questions that um, it's a good habit to train yourself as a game designer. And so I appreciated that. I, there were a few times where it, you know, mo most of the examples, uh, when it, when it kind of got into that advice and recommendations, I would say fell into very established best practices and things that would be widely agreed upon as far as like, yes, this is a, a negative effect that this mechanism would have on the game versus a positive effect. And there were maybe a few times that I felt like it skirted a little bit closer to the line of kind of the author's maybe personal taste or opinions coming through, but I think they did a pretty good job of staying on the side of, of industry best practices. And, and you know, they're, they're best practices for a reason, right? Like when we break down these mechanisms and break down what's actually happening in the game experience, it, it makes sense with the objective pieces why those become best practices. And so I think that's a valuable piece um, of this book is, is that added advice. Um, and so I, I think that I, I got a lot out of it and I, I enjoyed reading, reading those thoughts from the authors. Another big benefit that I saw myself getting out of this book was simply the way that it sparked new game designs. And this is, you know, if you're a game designer, you probably can relate to kind of drawing inspiration from a lot of different places. I mean, you might be reading a book completely not related to game design and it sparks ideas and gets you thinking about game design. You might just, you know, be on the bus and, and it starts firing with ideas. Um, but I tell you, when I was reading through this and I'm reading through kind of the mechanisms and the examples of using those mechanisms, it is just like, overload of ideas of how you might use that mechanism. Ooh, this would be a cool thing. Or maybe this is kind of a tangential related thing that you could do. And, and maybe not even specifically with designs I'm working on, but just ideas, right? And so that's a huge benefit, right? Like if you have something that can help you generate quality ideas and help you brainstorm, um, that's of high value. And so I think that's another thing that you can expect to get out of this book is simply get the get get the the wheels turning a little bit and i could see it being a useful tool for uh getting unstuck like i could see myself being stuck in a design and just going back and reading through some of these whether it was some maybe related sections to kind of what i'm working on or maybe completely unrelated i mean it's simply a lot of examples that are very you know game design centric and i think going through that is just going to Help, help spark things and get things moving again. Um, and so I think that's another thing that you can expect to get out of this book. Now, my experience with this book so far was a single straight read through. So I, I basically just read it cover to cover and I found that to be a very rewarding experience and I, I enjoyed it and I got a lot out of it. But as I was saying with, with kind of how it sparks so many ideas, it's almost too much as far as like drinking from the fire hose. I mean, you could, finish just reading one mechanism and probably stop and have a good half hour brainstorm and, and just thinking about that one mechanism. But when I'm reading straight through, I'm kind of on to the next one. And so I almost don't give myself the chance to chew on it a little more. And so I think the real value of this book is going to be 
as a reference to come back to at times. I think that first read through was great and I honestly may end up reading through it again cover to cover, but I think in addition to that, you would want to have it as a reference to, you know, look up things that maybe are related to what you're working on or maybe you remember something from it that you wanna check and read through. Um, but just allowing yourself to come back to it and, and keep pulling value out of it because there is like, a lot of dense value in the book. Um, and I think it's worth being aware, you know, how you're going to ensure that you get that value out of it. When you're thinking about, is this a book that, you know, I should add to my library? I think you have to really ask yourself the question, am I going to intentionally come back to it or use it in a way that's going to allow me to continually get that value? Because I would say if you were going to get the book and just read through it once, I would maybe be a little harder pressed to recommend it. it. I think it would be a great experience, but as I'll talk about a little bit later with the, with the price point and some of these you know other things, it a single read through, you, you're gonna get some out of it, but you're really gonna be missing out on, on some of the potential uh, and really what I think the book is intending its use to be for you. And so this also makes it harder to recommend renting the book, which may be one way to get around the cost of it you know, rent it and do a straight read through. And I think that's just harder for me to recommend given that I think the value of this book comes out of not just being able to read through it, but to have it on the shelf and be able to reference it and look back at it and reread it. And it's just that kind of book. And so I think if, if you're thinking you're just looking for a single read through and you, you don't think that's how you would use it, I think you would at least have to look into or, or, or give second thoughts to whether it's it's worth you pursuing um, looking into it. Now, without a doubt, the biggest barrier to people buying, reading this book is going to be the price point. So if you're, if you're buying it new, you're probably looking at a little under $70 US dollars, which for a lot of people, you're gonna hear that and it's like that, you know, it's a deal breaker, right? Like you maybe wouldn't even consider a book half, half that cost. Maybe you're not in, Avid readers typically spend much money on books. Um, and I, th I, I want to talk about it a little bit because I think that's um, going to be really one of the biggest considerations for a lot of people. One, as I mentioned earlier, it really is a one-of-a-kind book. Like, it, it's the only book that breaks down tabletop game design mechanisms in this way. So you're not going to be getting this, the same kind of content for cheaper elsewhere, right? Like this is going to be, if this is what you're looking for, this is the book that's going to offer it to you. Secondly, it is very much written and presented more like an academic textbook, which when you start thinking, you know, if you remember what textbooks tend to cost, that starts to frame it a little differently compared to like, oh, if I was just picking up some arbitrary, you know, book that I was going to read that can kind of, kind of at least put it in context where the, the cost is coming from. But I think the bigger factor is just realizing this is a niche book like this. The audience for this is a pretty small audience, but people who are interested in tabletop game design, you know, and are passionate about it to the point that they would want to read, an, you know, an academic textbook like presentation of over 180 different mechanisms and the difference between them is not the kind of audience that's, you know, going to make the, the bestseller list, right? And so I think knowing that, for me, purchasing this book was a little bit of, you know, giving back to the, uh, the authors and kind of putting, putting my money where my, my mouth is in a way, saying, hey, this is the kind of content that I would love to see produced for, for this medium of, of tabletop game design, right? I would love to see more kind of resources that approach it from kind of this academic perspective and really break it down um, with more detailed analysis. And the reality is, if these, you know, if when these types of things are produced, if they don't sell at all, it's much less likely that these types of resources are going to continue to be created. So for me, I realize I'm, you know, smack dab in the target audience for this book. And realizing that that audience is rather slim, I'm a little more willing 
to pay more than maybe I would normally pay for for a book. Um, to to get, to get that one of a kind of experience and also um, support that and hope that you know we can see more and more of that because it really does push the whole hobby forward and kind of raise all ships um, when game designers are are working to to hone their craft right and the, this is the kind of thing that really can help a game designer hone their craft um, and so that may be reasons for you to reason enough for you want to to get past the cost and want to pick it up it might not be and that's totally fine right everybody's going to be in their their own um place as far as the the value they think they're going to get out of it um versus the, the cost of picking it up but I, I wanted to touch on it and you know hopefully this video is able to provide kind of what to expect from it and kind of maybe some of the benefits that you could get out of it and considerations um, I would encourage, I, I linked down in the description below, I'd encourage following that link to Amazon and just checking the, the little look inside um, image that you can pull up the table of contents and read through it a little bit. And honestly, you know, if you read through the table of contents and, and the first maybe couple examples and you say to yourself, I would love, you know, to read 180 more of these and you're reading through the table of contents and it's piquing your interest, then that will go a long way in telling you if this is a book that you're going to enjoy reading. Um, but if there's any other questions that you think would help, help to clear you up to determine if it's something you should check out, I'd be happy to answer them in the comments below. And I can at least say, speaking for myself, I'm glad I picked it up. I'm glad it's going to be on my shelf. I think I'm going to continue to get value out of it um, over the years as a reference to go back to. And I applaud the authors for all the work they put in for pulling together all the research to make something like this. Um, I know I appreciate it and many other designers do as well. Um, thanks for checking out this video um, and I will see you in the next one.